Hello and welcome everyone to another open air training webinar on Horizon Europe Open Science Requirements and Practice. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly go over a few housekeeping notes. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be made publicly available shortly afterward. If you have any questions, comments or thoughts during the webinar, please use the Q&A section. You can also upvote questions you'd like to, our speakers to prioritize. If we are unable to address all questions during the session, we will follow up with a blog post after the webinar. You can find a link to the presentations on this slide and you can scan the QR code to access them directly. Additionally, I will share the link in the chat. And now I'd like to introduce and warmly welcome our speakers for today. We have Jonathan England, training specialist at Open Air, who will be going over the Open Science Horizon Europe requirements and share some tips, tools and services you can use to make sure that you're compliant with them. We also have Victoria Tsukala, Open Science Policy Officer at the European Commission, who will provide insights in, into the EC's open access publishing platform, Open Research Europe. With this brief introduction, I would like to hand the floor over to Jonathan to begin their presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marilyn. So let me just share my screen. And... So today, as uh, Marilyn mentioned, and you already know this, um, I will be talking about how in practice really um, to comply with all the different open science requirements from uh, uh, for from the European Commission. Um, I run this webinar three times a year, so in case you've already seen this webinar, there are actually a few uh, changes compared to the previous one, so um, especially in, in terms of the trusted repository. I will mention it, but um, if you've watched it before, um, just so you're aware. So um, these slides are already online um, and uh, I've put a lot of different links and references for you. So I won't cover always all the different slides uh, because some are just for, for your reference as, uh, as links. Um, and we run this three times a year. So the next one is already planned for the 14th of March. So as you know, open science is an umbrella term to make research more accessible to everyone, more discoverable, uh, more transparent. And um, a lot of people will know about, you know, open access to publication, um, about uh, data. Um, but the European Commission goes a bit further with um, this um, umbrella term. So there's also the, a big emphasis on providing information about any outputs, tools, instruments to validate and reuse uh, the results of the data. Um, and also you need to provide um, digital and physical access to, to the results to validate the conclusions. I will go back to, to this, but it's something to, to bear in mind in terms of a bit the difference uh, with the usual open science uh, definition. So let's start with publications. So this is just an overview. This is just for your reference. I'm not going to, this is basically what I'm going to cover now, but it's in, in one slide. So let's go a bit more in details. In terms of the requirements, um, the, the, the requirements of um, open access to publications is only for peer-reviewed publications. So for instance, uh, um, conference proceedings or um, uh, science reports or something like that, that wouldn't be uh, peer-reviewed, wouldn't apply. But it is recommended by the European Commission to always share in open access your your any type of work that you do. There are no restrictions on where you can publish, and I'll go back to this afterwards. Um, this means that you can publish in uh, what so-called hybrid journals. There are only restrictions in terms of uh, what can be claimed on, on the budget. Um, the main important things about the mandate is to deposit one of the versions of the peer-reviewed version of your manuscript on a repository. So in just a second, now we'll go over what different versions are and what are trusted repositories. But even if you're um, paying to publish open access, you always need to deposit on a repository. Um, a difference with, if you were funded by H2020 in the past, 
is the providing immediate open access to publication. So no embargo periods are, are allowed. So as soon as the work is published, you need to have it on the repository in open access. Another difference also with uh, Horizon Europe is that you need to retain on one of the version, on one of the peer-reviewed version of your manuscript, um, um, your rights by applying a CC BY uh, Creative Commons uh, license, which again, I will go into those terms a bit later. And as I mentioned before, you need to provide information about any research outputs, tools, instruments, and you need to acknowledge the EU as usual and the acronym and the, the codes of the, the project. So there are different versions um, of your manuscript and there are different terms that are used and the European Commission uses uh, specific words. Um, so you have the version when you submit, which is not uh, peer reviewed. And then after it goes through all this uh, peer reviewing process, you will have what I call the ugly version. So basically it's not uh, edited, it's just the plain text. It's exactly the same content as the uh, final version edited by the publisher, but just not made pretty. And so the author accepted manuscript is that peer reviewed, but not yet edited by the publisher. And the version of record is um, basically the same content, the peer reviewed, but made um, more engaging, let's say, by the, by the publisher. So both of those uh, versions are uh, compliant uh, for, for open access. So let's talk a bit about what actually I mean by depositing on a repository. So repositories or open repositories are and those kind of digital platforms archive that uh, ensure basically that your work has a, a long-term preservation um, aspect to it which means that social networking sites like ResearchGate, Academia are very useful. Um, the publisher's website obviously also has uh, your, your publication, your profile page on the institution website, you can upload it. But those are not considered as repos repositories because they don't have the technical um, uh, aspects to maintain this long-term preservation. So we, we call self-archiving, meaning that you always have to upload a version, so all the author accepting manuscript or the version of record on a repository. And this is regardless of where you publish. So whether you publish in open access, you pay the fee or not, you always need to, to do that. There's a couple of um, exceptions, which I will mention afterwards. Um, but in, in general, you, you have to do it. So this is uh, one of the slides that has changed a bit compared to previous um, talks that they've given because there are new, uh, there's a new study that was uh, published that kind of um, makes a bit more, um, builds a list basically of what the um, compliant repositories are in terms of the European Commission. So up to now, I basically said that um, you could search on OpenAI Explore or Open Door for publications um, and look for a repository that would fall into one of those three categories that uh, is on the slide. But there is an issue with um, this, uh, what we call metadata, which is the description of the data, like the title, the author, the license. And so there are some requirements and not all those so-called trusted repositories have those uh, metadata requirements. So far, based on that study, there's only four uh, repositories, four of those trusted repositories that really comply um, for, um, uh, for Horizon Europe. A lot of them are making changes, so uh, this list is unfortunately not being going to be up, uh, updated. Um, so your uh, repository might not be in it, but it doesn't mean that it's not um, compliant. And a lot of them might be become compliant in, uh, in the future. So um, you can have a look at the study on the list, which is in Annex 1. Um, in doubt, unfortunately, what I'm going to say is 
uh, deposit on Zenodo. Zenodo is a, a general purpose uh, repository and it complies with everything. So if you have any doubts of whether repository is or is not compliant, just deposit on Zenodo and at least you're sure that at least from a Horizon Europe point of view, you comply. Obviously, that means that doesn't mean you cannot uh, upload it on your institution's uh, repository or on a domain specific one. Um, but you know, um, it it ensures that you're you're compliant at least. Um, the only thing I want to mention about the license, which is this Creative Commons license that I've mentioned before. Um, well, maybe I can just give an overview of what it is. Uh, so it's an open license, basically, that removes um, any doubts of what can and cannot be done uh, with your work. Um, so you keep an authorship of the work, uh, but you grant certain rights to, to others. And um, the Creative Commons attribution license is what allows people to reuse, reshare, um, adapt uh, as long as they cite you. Um, there are different ways, obviously, to achieve that. You can publish in full open access, which, you know, the version of record will be uh, open access so that the license is already uh, applied automatically. When you publish in a hybrid venue, so those um, um, journals, for instance, that subscription based, but also allow you to pay for open access, um, you can publish in those. Uh, we'll see that there's a restrictions in terms of the budget. Um, but sometimes they will offer you different licenses, and so be sure to always select uh, CC BY. And we'll see just in a second that uh, even if you publish in a closed journal, you can still retain your rights, at least on the author accepted manuscripts. Um, one, uh, especially for humanities and uh, social sciences, if you're um, uh, publishing a long-term format, a monograph, a book, then you can um, put a more restrictive license. So you don't have to put a CC by license. Um, but an, a note that uh, a chapter, uh, so in an edited book, is considered as an article. So it's not considered as a long text uh, format. So the rights retention statement is something that you would uh, add to your manuscript when you send it to the, the, the publisher. And basically it's uh, saying that the EU is um, requiring you to have at least one uh, license, uh, one of version of your manuscript under CC BY, and therefore you're putting the uh, a CC BY license on the author accepted manuscript. Sometimes some publishers might try and trick you into not doing that, but you need to know that you 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 have to uh, have you know retain your rights at least on the author accepted manuscript. So this is not uh, an option. If you really cannot do that with uh, a publisher, then you will have to change um, uh, the the publishing venue you you were considering. Um, to check the journal's eligibility, you have the journal checker tool, um, which allows you to um, put a journal, put your funder, so European Commission, your institution if it's relevant, and then it will tell you which routes are available to you. And this is just a diagram of showing you kind of a recap of what I, I just said. So in terms of budget, uh, it's um, the the fees, open access fees for full open access journals are covered by the by the grants. Um, but if you're publishing in a hybrid venue, meaning those venues that you know are closed, some are, some articles are closed, others you can pay for open access. Um, and this includes, you might have heard of that with this Plan S, Correlation S, um, what they consider as transformative journals or uh, transformative agreements, even those are not uh, reimbursable under the uh, uh, the uh, the grants. There is an exception. MSCA, so Marie Curie fellowships, are um, can use their 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 money as they want, uh, so they can actually um, um, reimburse uh, article processing charges 
or book processing charges, depending on what you're publishing, um, on on their budgets. But overall, for all Horizon Europe uh, programs, you you cannot. And as before, any printing fees uh, cannot be um, are not eligible for under the the budget. I mentioned this before, um, research outputs, tools and instruments to validate uh, can be anything from data to protocols, uh, notebooks, um, and you need to include the description of, you know, what, um, what tool is being used, how to access it, um, if it's any commercial products, you know, the, it needs to be um, um, a full, presentation of uh, this information. And obviously, as with everything, it's recommended to make this uh, all this open access. There is another option that is available to you, which is Open Research Europe, which is the European Commission's uh, um, um, publishing platform. So Victoria Tsukala, who is from the European Commission uh, and is one of our speakers today, um, <clears throat> will be presenting, but she couldn't be here at the beginning. So uh, usually we present it at this time, but she will present it at, at the end. And um, if she doesn't make it, then we will I will present it. But uh, we'll go back to, to this. But this is a, a different uh, option. And with this uh, option, you don't have to deposit uh, to self-archive because uh, Open Research Europe will do it for, for you directly on Zenodo. So um, this is sometimes the advantage, and it's um, open to all um, um, EC projects. OK, so now this is an um, overview about publication. Now let's go to um, your requirements in terms of research data. Um, so there's a few uh, aspects that are important that uh, are mentioned that you must manage your data in line with the FAIR principles. So the FAIR principles are a set of um, um, guidelines to manage your uh, research data in the best way, to make sure that from the beginning, from, you know, even before you collect data or you, you know, combine data, um, you know what you're going to do, um, how you're going to organize it, how you're going to make it available to others afterwards. And this is formally um, uh, done through um, what's this uh, document called a data management plan, which is required by month six. So I would recommend really to start writing the, the, the DMP, the data management plan, at the very beginning of your project, because it takes time to um, collect um, uh, all this information and think about all this. Um, you also need to deposit uh, data and this uh, descriptive um, uh, elements, uh, fields, which are called metadata, as soon as possible after production. Um, so this means that as soon as you've generated the, the data, Unless there are reasons why, which we will see in a second, uh, you should deposit uh, this. And if you cannot make it open, at least you have to uh, make the metadata available online. You have to deposit again in a repository, in a trusted repository, with the principle of as uh, open as possible, as closed as necessary. So. It doesn't necessarily need to be open, but you need to justify it. But it needs to follow the FAIR principles. I won't go into details about the FAIR principles because it's a big topic, and I would recommend you looking at um, other resources or contacting um, your um, people within your institutions to learn more about uh, this. So the data management plan, just a few more elements. It's a living document. So even if you do it by month six, you have to uh, update it. If you know a new, um, a new um, data set you want to be using or new way you want to be sharing the data comes up, then you will need to to update that to reflect uh, to reflect it. And you need to update once more uh, to, uh, before the end of the project. What I hear a lot is, you know, do you have a template with 
the answers or you know and the unfortunately the the the, the answer is there is no right or answer there's no absolute you know i cannot give you a template of how to to answer because it's really dependent on uh, your project the only thing that is really important is to be very specific and detailed and justified decision so you don't necessarily, for instance, need to open the data, but you need to justify why you're not doing it. So as long as you justify why you selected a specific commercial software or why you selected um, a certain way of doing it, as long as you um, justify it, um, that's what matters more for the project officer. Again, there's this issue with the trusted repositories. In this case, there are actually five trusted uh, repositories uh, for, for data. Uh, there's the Austrian and the, the French that are um, national repositories that you can use and compliant. But again, uh, if you are in doubt, use the Nodo. Um, so um, you can look for data repositories on RISC data and open Air explore, but it really, really in doubt uh, and you can't manage to find this information um, this is currently unfortunately the recommendation that i could uh, give to you to comply it's not perfect because it shouldn't always be in a general purpose repositories repository but that's the, the current uh, situation um, so in terms of the data it has to be either uh, under um, Creative Commons uh, attribution license, which is the same as for uh, the publications, or it can be a CC0 license, which is basically kind of uh, public domain. And there are reasons why we prefer uh, CC0, so kind of public domain. I won't go into details about this, uh, but it's something that you need to, to look into. Um, and the European Commission does prefer uh, CC0. Again, you need to put detailed information about research outputs, as I mentioned uh, uh, before. So there are uh, um, reasons why you don't want to open the data. So as I said, you want to follow the FAIR principles, but you don't necessarily need to open the data. And so this can be because it's commercially valuable. Uh, so if, for instance, you do a, a patent, you need to publish the patent first uh, before the, the data, because if you publish the data first, then the patent cannot be filed because it's not novel anymore. Um, any data protection, privacy rules or sensitive data, obviously, um, medical information, this kind of data has to be anonymized before or there can be in cases where um, it cannot be shared at all. Um, and also if it has any security rules um, or some strategic uh, interest to, to the EU. There's also exceptions uh, in terms of uh, public emergencies. And if you close the data, uh, giving access to specific experts for uh, validating the, the findings. Um, so in terms of public emergencies, this was added uh, because of the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. Um, you need to provide basically immediate open access to both publications and research outputs. Um, and even if there's a, um, some uh, conflict of um, interests, for instance, commercially valuable, there's still some uh, openness that you need to, to comply with. Um, a note is that that doesn't apply for ERC projects. So um, this is the only exceptions that don't have to follow those, uh, those rules. So I'm going to mention a few tools, especially one that is uh, new, which is uh, the ERC EU node. Um, I don't think many people know about it because it's really relatively new. Um, it's basically for, um, depending on your organization, um, so I'm not sure all organizations are um, part of, of this, but it's basically a platform that allows uh, you, if uh, you're part of a um, member organization, to have access to very useful tools. And um, 
some of those tools are really important for the FAIR principles. So file sync and sharing uh, in a secure environment is really important if you need to do a large file transfer or um, uh, sharing documents uh, in real time. Um, it avoids you having to use um, commercial uh, um, tools that might have uh, GDPR issues. Um, so yeah, the link is on it. Uh, you can log in with your institution and um, it, it works as um, a credit system. So every three months you get resets a certain number of credits and each service uses a certain number of, uh, of credits. OpenAI Explorer, I've mentioned before, is um, basically a catalog of um, everything you want, <laughs> um, including publication, data sets, um, repositories, or even data management plans and everything, basically. So it's a useful tool when you're looking for something. Amnesia is interesting if you have medical um, data or um, data that you want to anonymize. Uh, to be able to to share and argus is um, a dmp tool that allows you to that is compliant with also um, um, with um, is connected to the, the european commission um, so that it's easier for you to write the dmp there's already uh, templates from the horizon europe dmp template in it uh, and it's interconnected so um, it's a quite a useful tool so now you get an overview of this, and I know it's it can be, um, especially if it's the first thing you're hearing about all this, it can be overwhelming. So, yeah. Um, but um, this is basically an overview of uh, of the 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 requirements. Now, in terms of the reporting and the monitoring, when you're on the um, on the uh, on the portal. Uh, the participants portal, um, you will also have to comply with a few more, um, they're not mandates, but um, requirements, basically, um, because there's an extensive reporting about open science practices and uh, the project officers will review those. So on the participants um, portal, there's the, the continuous reporting with the, um, the publications and the, the data sets. So under publications, usually if you provided, um, if you published or if you upload it on a repository that is compliant, it should um, appear in that list. Um, if it's not, then you can add new ones and you can edit this uh, metadata fields uh, if it's not complete enough. Um, so this is just for, for reference what each means, because sometimes it can be a bit confusing what, you know, type of ID, uh, PID and, and those the things. So this is for reference. Data sets is the same. You can uh, add new ones if they're not complete, others that are a bit incomplete. And then you have um, a time which is results and then other results. So. The results tab focus on uh, the content of the results. So anything that is discoveries, theories, products, services, methods, whereas the other results is uh, for reporting this kind of um, additional um, tools, say like software, workflows, protocols. Um, so yeah, if you have any doubts, I'm sure in your institution, you will have someone uh, that can support you for Rising Europe project, um, but uh, yeah, that's for for reference. Now, um, the main focus of the the this presentation is not about uh, the grant proposal stage, so before uh, getting the uh, the grant, but I, I still wanted to to include a few a few aspects so that you are aware if you're only thinking about applying for a project. So uh, this is mainly for Horizon Europe. It is different for ERC or um, uh, MSCA, um, but there are different uh, parts of the, um, the project proposal where you have to mention uh, open science. Um, 
there's you should be citing publication that are available in open access um, meaning that they're on a repository um, and i'm sure you know that but um, um, funders are not really most funders are not really looking at the impact factor anymore of uh, for journal it's really the content of the publication that you will mention that will be um, looked at and in terms of uh, research data, any data that you want to provide <clears throat> uh, should be available um, following the FAIR principles. At that stage, the DMP is not, uh, a formal DMP is not um, needed because you need, uh, it's only by month six. But they do ask you uh, some to kind of um, get a brief idea of um it's kind of like a short dmp so you still need to to look at uh, to do this exercise in in any case um and one of the things is a distinct work package for project management as a dmp as a deliverable um important aspects in the budget to consider for um open access uh, costs so article processing charges or book processing charges uh, data curation costs, a lot of people don't know that, but you can put it as a cost um, to have a data curator and help you with um, um, being compliant with the FAIR principles and anything that is uh, relating to engagement of um, citizens through citizen science or uh, crowdsourcing activities also is very well seen <clears throat> by the Commission. So in terms of uh, a tip that I, I can give you um, for open science um, specifically, is to be as specific as, pos as possible, but that's you know, um, general to a grant proposal and make it easy for the project officer to, to find that information. Um, and also in the grant proposal, you don't need to explain open access, fair data, um, open science you, in the DMP either, you don't need to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> you need to focus on what exactly you're, you're going to do to comply with those different open science uh, elements. <clears throat> Sorry. There are um, two special cases, the ERC and the um, MSCA. Uh, so the ERC doesn't have an explicit evaluation of open science, but it is included implicitly and um, um, so it's it's a different, um, it's still an important part of ERC, but it's not evaluated uh, directly. You can only increase um, your score for getting the, the grant. And the <clears throat> MSCA has um, um, specific elements in, in, under the excellent criteria, and also it asks you to do specific training activities and um, uh, career development plan that has to uh, take into consideration open science uh, initiatives. And as I mentioned in, in, in the, um, previously, uh, there's no cost eligibility rules for article processing charges, meaning you can publish uh, wherever you want and um, get those um, APCs, those open access fees, uh, reimbursed by the project, even if it's a hybrid uh, venue. So there's a set of recommended practices also done by the uh, commission. It's important to know that in the evaluation, uh, those are never taken into account negatively. So if you don't address them, your score will not diminish, but addressing them or including them in your proposal will always, uh, well, can only increase it. Um, so it's um, something to, to bear in mind. There's different types of uh, open science uh, practices, uh, recommended practices. You have pre-registration where <clears throat> you um, publish the, the plan basically for, for a study before doing it. Um, and that gives you, um, um, how do you say? It gives you um, timestamp basically on um, on that um, study plan. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, preprints, which is depositing uh, your your work on a preprint server before uh, publication, uh, before it's it's peer reviewed. Open Research Europe kind of works in that sense where you um, you publish and then the preprint is already available. Um, and then there's an open peer review. Victoria will, will mention that in, in, in a while. But I've been researching it. It's not a preprint server, but it's, um, it has some elements of, of it. And obviously, if you do public engagement or anything like that, it can only increase. And citizen science, of course, also. So just to finish and to not uh, continue talking for too long and to leave time for, for questions, because I think this is really the important aspect of um, this kind of webinars. Um, really, when if from the, the start or if you've already started, um, it, it's really good to have an open science strategy to know what you're going to do with everything. So it's not just about compliance, but it's like, also how you're going to comply and who's going to be responsible for what and who's going to check, you know, that something is compliant or not. Um, so really discuss this within the, um, uh, if, if you're part of a consortium, part of, you know, uh, working with more than one institution um, and make sure that all of this information is planned beforehand. Um, Make updates, so like the DMP is a um, living document. Um, for instance, the EOSCU node was something that uh, didn't exist a year ago. So people might have been sharing with a different uh, tool. Whereas now there's this file sync uh, tool, which is much better for um, uh, EU grant holders. So it's something that you would uh, change and inform on the DMP or this kind of thing. So always adapt uh, with um, the new best practices. And it's okay to have issues or doubts. And uh, as long as you you make sure that you're honest about it and trying to, to resolve it. Um, as I said, the next webinar is on uh, 14th of March. But uh, yeah, this is for me. I don't know if um, Victoria is here. No, I don't think so. Okay, then I will talk about her presentation. Okay. So I mentioned Open Research Europe uh, in the past. It is um, uh, the European Commission's own publishing platform. It's not a repository. So it's not one of those trusted repositories, it's really a publishing platform. So you're not publishing in another journal and then in in uh, depositing on Open Research Europe. It's really um, a publishing platform. Um, it is peer reviewed uh, and it's open to all uh, EU programs. So even H2020 can still uh, use it. Obviously it's optional. Uh, you don't have to use it because, as I mentioned before, uh, you can uh, publish wherever you want. Um, but it's a very practical tool that is available to you at no cost and even after the project has ended. And the good thing with this is that it has automatic compliance with um, the uh, publication uh, requirements because it's deposited automatically on Zenodo for you. So. With this, you wouldn't need to self-archive. Um, so it's a bit different sometimes to what you're used to because it's uh, under what's called a open peer review and specifically a post-publication peer review. So first you publish and then the review takes place. Um, once uh, all, all the different reviews, all the different um, and the versions of your, your manuscript are all under a Creative Commons license. So again, that complies. And uh, there is, um, it's a proper publishing venue with scientific advisory boards, um, with guidelines and, and all this. It is a transparent service, especially because of the open peer review. Uh, and it publishes in all uh, disciplines. Um, so there are different communities, different collections that exist. 
um, and uh, I think she added uh, no, okay. But th there's a, a different types of uh, within each um, uh, public um, types. There are different types of uh, uh, publications, basically, um, that you can do, like uh, scientific reports or data um, reports. So not just publications. It's indexed. Uh, meaning that it's findable in all types of um, places, including Scopus and uh, and PubMed. Um, um, yeah, so it was launched in 2021, uh, and up to now it's had uh, over uh, 1,000 submissions, uh, near the same amount published. Um, and yeah, this is a bit more information about um, the, the current status. So the way it works, as I said, is you submit an article. There's a set of pre-publication checks that uh, the in-house team does um, to make sure that you know it follows uh, different the different policies, the different ethical guidelines. Um, so this is done uh, before it's um, published. And then it's published, uh, and um, you have also the data that is published uh, alongside. Um, and uh, um, uh, then happens the, the 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 peer review. So one aspect that has changed uh, from previous um, of the last months, and especially if you saw this uh, talk in the past, before it was the authors that uh, recommended uh, publishers. Um, Review, sorry. Uh, whereas now it's um, they are selected. So there's a number of expert reviewers that are selected and invited for publications. Um, the pub the reviewer's name is published alongside the reviews and um, is. Are you still? Okay, I don't know what happened. Anyway. Um, I lost my train of thought. Um, yes, the names of the reviewers are um, uh, published alongside the, the reviews and they are publicly available. Once two out of uh, at least three uh, reviewers have um, accepted the, uh, without revision, the, um, the, um, the publication, then it becomes actually published, and um, it's not in the um, uh, pre-peer review. It's not in the peer review process. It's peer reviewed. Um, yeah. So pre-publication checks I've mentioned, and there's different um, elements that are done, um, and. <laughs> Excuse me for interrupting. I, I can see that Victoria Tukala has joined the webinar. Okay. So if she's yeah, I'll, happy I'll just, to continue. Yeah, I'll just finish because I'm towards the end, but then she can be here of for, course. for Thank question. You. Thanks. Thanks. Um yeah. And um well, Victoria can go a bit um more in details uh, later if if you want. Um but um, open peer review has a lot of advantages in terms of transparency and making sure that um, both the reviewers and the authors are rewarded um, because a lot of the time, as you know, reviewers are um, don't get credited or you know it's an invisible. Let's say uh, it's, it's not part of the assessment um, process of researchers. Um, so there's a lot of um, good aspects to, to, open, to open peer review, which is what is used for Open Research Europe. Um, that I don't know what uh, it is. So actually, <laughs> Victoria, if you want to unmute yourself and, and, uh, and say something. We cannot hear you, Victoria. Um, 
No, still there is no sound. Okay. Um, let's just finish and then we can add it as a, as a question. But um, yeah. basically, Basically, alongside your publication, you would be uh, publishing your, your data, selecting a repository, and uh, linking it uh, so that everything is linked to, to your publication. Um, there's a different... Um, uh, ah, that's the slide I wanted to, to find the, before. There are different types of um, publications that exist, so... Um, so that's uh, depending on the different um, on on the fields, and this is uh, something you can look at on on this slide and on on the website also to to gain more information. Um, so this is the QR code, and this is the end of this. Can you? Yeah. Now I probably you can hear me now, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize again to Jonathan for uh, for running so late. It is quite unfortunate, but uh, I think he can do the presentation better than I, frankly. Uh, <laughs> only to say that uh, I mean the platform is evolving. Um, I think uh, you were shown also some uh, some data from you know publications, authors. It's growing with the researcher community, so that's important. Uh, it's important that you can comply to your open access requirements by publishing in this platform. Basically, you can do two things. Comply, because the platform then deposits peer-reviewed publications with Zenodo. And the requirement of Horizon Europe is that you provide uh, immediate open access through a repository. So this is done for you. But also it gives the opportunity to researchers to experiment in publishing in a you know innovative way with post-publication open peer review which can be very interesting and of course it's um open science uh, practices that we're seeking to support this so this is uh very much uh supportive of the direction the future direction uh, or the direction that uh we're trying to uh, push a research to we understand that this might not be easy for everyone and that, you know, the platform does not have an impact factor. And that's a very common question that we get. So maybe you will not uh, uh, bring in there, you know, your publications that you want for um, for evaluation. But maybe the fact that there are so many types of articles uh, that you can you can publish there will allow you to experiment and see the platforms, the the. Um, uh, the input we're getting from from researchers is is very good, so I would highly recommend that uh, that uh, that you try it. Um, and just also to say that um, uh, we're working also with national assessment agencies. For example, we learned that in Spain now the platform is included in the journals that are okay to publish and are accounted for your professional advancement. So that's quite important. And we know that a lot of institutions are gradually trying and taking this into consideration. Um, and we know that this will gradually um, drive, uh, you know, up the submissions. But uh, um, this is a tool for the researchers who have, uh, who are grants with us. And we highly recommend that uh, you try both on account of complying with the requirements, but possibly even more importantly, because there are other ways that you can comply, but um, that you can also try publishing the open science way. So any questions? Uh, I don't know that you would like me to answer. Yeah, we're, we're going to, we were going to go to, to questions now. So we'll take them by most upvotes. And so you, before we do that, I just wanted to mention also, Remember that, because you were talking about the impact factor, but also remember that a lot of institutions have signed different types of agreements that they're not going to take into account impact factors. So even if some institutions are still doing it, um, a lot of them are, are not. So it's... Yeah. Uh, and indeed, many have signed the Quora agreement, etc. Exactly. So I yeah. think this is very much in the same direction. So yeah. yes. Yeah. So it, it wouldn't... Yeah, it doesn't always impact where you, you publish. It's more the actual content now, uh, which is good because this is science. You know, it shouldn't yeah. be where you publish. Uh. Exactly. Okay, so let's have a look at the... So if you go in the Q&A, you can... 
sorry. In the Q&A, you can write your, your questions and you can uh, please upvote any question you uh, you find uh, interesting. So I'll go to, um, go to the first one. So how are data management plans evaluated after they are submitted as deliverables by month six? Does the European Commission project officer evaluate and accept the plans or are data management specialists employed or is an implicit acceptance with a follow-up smaller selection of DMPs. So yes, in practice, it's the project officers that will um, evaluate. I'm I'm unsure if there are sometimes um, other experts that are involved in it. I don't think so, but yes, yes. They are? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes, because the uh, uh, depending on the kind of projects, I mean, uh, the commission and the agencies that manage those projects usually employ reviewers. So the reviewers are asked to uh, uh, to also assess uh, the DMPs because they are deliverables. And if the project does not have reviewers, then the project officer will do it. But we do give guidelines to them on how, how to do this. Huh? And, and, and in general, our preference, not preference, I mean, you can do what you want, but fair needs to be addressed somehow. And this it provides a nice structure, actually, and an easy way to explain to the researchers as well as um, uh, to uh, to whoever is evaluating this, how to address this. And when you, uh, of course, the um, uh, specialized experts come in, then they also can address better the situation, for example, in a specific discipline, right? So that's quite uh, important. And I, I should have mentioned yes that the the the, um, the Horizon Europe DMP template that exists is not mandatory. It's very useful because it gives you the because uh, I mentioned it, but I should have mentioned that it's not mandatory if you have a better way that you already know how you want to format it. But for most people, it is very useful because it structures how the the EC wants to 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 do it. Um, Although it depends on the specific project, is there a general checklist or to-do list that Horizon Europe project manager can follow to ensure smooth implementation of the open science and data management process? Um, a checklist? Do you want to answer that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, there is no checklist. Let me think a checklist per se, uh, but well, guidelines. I guess uh, the guidelines. There, I'm sorry, there, uh, we have guidelines and the, the the grant agreement is very is very clear on what is required. I mean, there's two articles, so you really can. I mean, that might be you can create a, a checklist, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think Jonathan also you know showed you what the requirements are. Um, yes, so not a checklist, but two articles in the in the grant agreement really that uh, are you know one on publications, one on on research data really, and. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, if you read those two articles, it should be including also the guidance, rather clear what we should, you should be doing, and also the annotated uh, grant agreement. So, thanks. Um, if a data set, <clears throat> sorry, if a data set cannot be openly published due to intellectual property rights, should metadata still be deposited openly in a repository? Yes, there's no real reason why not. If it's something, um, if there's really a, a real um, process that you need to, to follow, like um, patents, for instance, which has to be, you know, the rule for patents is to be novel, um, then yes, you should always favor um, the uh, any benefits that you would gain. So you don't always have to um, to do it immediately. You can, if you justify, for instance, in the um, the DMP, why you're not going to uh, make it available immediately, um, then it's, it's all right. But usually the metadata doesn't really inference, it's just that it tells others that it is available um, online. There might be some cases, and this is, you know, a case by case, um, but it's not the 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 uh, not um, the rule, I would say. Um, <clears throat> can you give example of what a trusted repository does? In other words, the criteria. Um, so trusted repositories have a set of technical 
um, functions, um, which I'm unable to tell you exactly what uh, I could say, tell you about, you know, OIA, PMH, and these kind of things. But um, without having to be technical, basically, um, it's it has a set of uh, guidelines it has to follow. So, for instance, it always has to um, uh, create a persistent identifier, um, usually a DOI, to be considered as uh, trusted. It has to have a policy um, um, that it will be a long-term preservation policy. It has to have some guidelines. It has to be openly accessible so without any restrictions you don't need you mustn't have to um, log in to be able to have access which you know for instance research gate you have to that's why it's not considered as uh, as one among other things because it's uh, also uh, proprietary um, so there's a lot of different um, aspects that really try and makes uh, those repositories uh, link between each other. It, um, it has some connection with the European Commission through different tools. Uh, so it will appear on Cordis, for instance. Um, so it's a set of a lot of technical infrastructures that ensure that not only long-term preservation, but also machine readable type of, of things. Um, if you're really interested, there's a lot of documentation about exactly what you know um the the uh, the um the trust seals and this kind of things um can i yeah. add something here jonathan yes, of course of course um, indeed and um i think we have some things also in the annotated grant agreement but uh, your first point of reference should be the library really if you have some questions <laughs> uh, yeah. i think they would be and and a relevant question to zenodo that was uh, uh, asked earlier, it's not more a more trusted repository than others, but it's in case, I mean, that your own institution does not have a trusted repository or that your research community does not have a repository that can be considered trusted. In this case, uh, the Commission offers this to you at no cost to you so that, uh, you know, we can solve the problem if there is if there is one, right, so that you can comply. Uh, to the requirements. So Zenodo is a trusted repository that we recommend. We fund also so that it stays up to date and is always trusted um, that you can use if you would like. Uh, and if you have no other repository to use, you don't know what is a trusted, your library cannot help. Your so uh, just to complement <laughs> this. Yeah, and and this is what I said in, in, um, in one of the slides that, you know, my recommendation was currently, if you have in doubt, to use the nodo, but as I said, it's not perfect. It, that shouldn't be um, my recommendation, basically, uh, because it should be. If you have a domain-specific one, you should definitely go into. If you have an institutional one, you should definitely uh, put in in that. In terms of the pure <clears throat> requirements, this is why I mentioned it. But the nodo is not better than others. It's just that, for instance, those presentation I give doesn't really fit in any type of repository. So I put them on Zenodo um, for them to be archived, basically, and accessible to, to everyone. But it's not better than than others uh, when you are you want to share knowledge. It's just more in terms of the actual uh, current requirements and current situation of uh, repositories. So yes, definitely. Um, uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. As noted, requirements and regulations for compliance are increasing, and implementation is up to the team's individuals involved. Yet our budgets are being slashed, and admin is often reduced. Will the EU offer some plan to address this gap? If not, it's to be expected people will fulfill minimum form with little thought or functions. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you to the ECA the floor, <laughs> if you want. Victoria. I, if well, I understand correctly, you think that the requirements are a lot and that you cannot meet them with the uh, with the existing budget. Uh, 
Yes, uh, of course. I mean, the, the the commission is not unique in that, right? We are actually only one funder of the many national and international funders that pretty much ask for the same thing, which is immediate open access to research, especially to research that's publicly financed, right? There is um, researchers have rights, but they have obligations and they have obligations towards society and the taxpayers as well. Um, so this is not a this is not a unique requirement. I mean, I understand that it, it is a requirement, but I would tend to think that with the existing the combination of the resources that you get from the commission and the ones that you have from your institutions, you should be able to meet them. I mean, uh, so I mean, it seems to me that people are quite used to even publish in in open access quite a bit. I could see a little problem if you're not you know, you're publishing in, in journals that are closed and then that, you know, may create an extra step for you. But uh, but research communities and, and, and research, uh, how to say, disciplines will need to gradually transition to, to open access. This is the way for the future. This is a common requirement by all funders and the society um, to also increase transparency in science and research and accountability. Uh, so we understand that this can be extra load but it is part of the work so we consider that to be part of the work um, and we try to give as many tools as possible so we give you uh, on the side of the commission we give you a platform to publish if you know you have nowhere else we give you a repository to publish guidelines i mean expenses that are you know uh, justifiable as as part of your project uh, i think it m does make sense for you to um, to discuss with your library, which is a, a major resource for data management planning, for open access planning, also in terms of publishing in open access. They do the deals, most of the, you know, uh, subscription and publishing deals. So your institution may already have complementary resources. So um, we think that, you know, taking advantage of all of them, but, you know, would, would help you to comply with without a uh, huge... Um, um, effort. On the other hand, of course, the new thing uh, for researchers, perhaps more than open access publishing, is research data management, really. And we saw that from transitioning from one framework program to the next. Um, and, and, and it's very clear to us that there are different levels of, of experience and familiarity in different disciplines. Um, we also do understand that uh, there's a lot of money spent by funders and institutions to re to reproduce data, if you wish, which because they're not accessible to others or because they are produced and their technical standards are so low that they are useless, basically, after a while. Uh, so it is also in the big picture of things, uh, it is also an issue of management of resources for, for funders. So, uh, but also importantly of reproducibility and trustworthiness of the research process itself. So we do understand how this may put off or may not necessarily be extremely easy for, for all researchers, but it is a process. So uh, we try to give as many tools and, and resources as possible. So. And, and I think sometimes also maybe the frustration is comes from that you don't have the budget because maybe you didn't plan for it because you didn't know that you could include people that can help you with the mm -hmm. the data management so this is why i also mentioned the, the grant proposal stage because a lot of those costs can be included it's just that if you didn't plan for open science or plan for this kind of things then yes you're stuck because you need to spend more time yourself to to comply and you don't have the money to have someone else to to do it so again, in plan for open science in the grant proposal stage to avoid this kind of things, really make your life uh, easier. Um, so I don't know if it was specific to um, budget in, in that sense, but something to, to bear in mind. <clears throat> um, okay, so the note is approved by the EC as a general repository, but is not approved by all university lawyers because CERN that hosts the NODO is an international organization and uh, has, ac according to GDPR, the status of a third party country. Uh, lawyers require GDPR compliance, which is so an unresolved issue. 
Um, I'm nearly sure, uh, I will need to check, but I'm nearly sure Zenodo complies with GDPR. They do comply, it, actually. Yeah. And we have to say that we are giving Zenodo money to uh, uh, further support the um, a research community section for Horizon Europe results in there. Uh, and they have to comply. I mean, this is in all our, and they're they're being checked. <laughs> so they they definitely are complying. Yes. Uh, so does the open eye guys contain all current policies and good practices? I don't think so. <laughs> I will need to check. Uh, it's better to just focus on this. Um, on this presentation right now, I, I I do know some of our website pages are are out uh, of date. I someone mentioned it the other day, um. So yeah, sorry about that. Um, but it's better to focus on on the webinar slides uh, for now. Uh, if we upload our data and manuscript only in institutional repository, are we failing to com <clears throat> to comply? Um. So, as I said, you would need to check this if it's um, <clears throat> part of this list of um, trusted repositories first, and that has uh, this kind of metadata fields. But uh, as I said, a lot of um, those repositories are changing the um, metadata fields to be compliant. So. The best way, because it's an institutional repository, is to contact uh, the the, um, the, uh, the repository uh, manager of your institution to check with them. That's the easiest way uh, to, to do so. Um, <clears throat> do you know, is there progress in getting Open Research Europe index uh, in Web of Science? I think this question comes up every uh, every time. Victoria, do sorry, you... yes, yes, for um, it is, uh, sorry, it is um, um, listed in Scopus, it's indexed in Scopus, it's indexed uh, uh, by PubMed Central, but not for Web of Science, and, uh, and it will not be, I think, I'm not sure whether it will be in the future, if it is, it will need to be by discipline, I think they have also, they're not very happy to, to, um, uh, to list platforms, but uh, we are discussing this with them. I'm not sure what the uh, where we are at now. Um, F1000 actually is discussing this with our contractor, uh, but for now it's not listed, no. Um, is it possible to upload to Zenodo metadata only, meaning without any <clears throat> data file attached? Um, so actually, no, you need to um, attach um, a file. <clears throat> so it's not perfect in that sense. Uh, it can be, um, um, we need to, to work on that um, at some point. So my recommendation so far is to basically put kind of a blank page saying, you know, that uh, you're not sharing the data for this reason. Um, but uh, no, the, you always need to attach um, at least one file um, to, to publish on, on Zenodo. Uh, we allowed to use DMP only or um, Data Steward Wizard to create uh, DMPs. Yes, you can use whatever tool you want. Um, there's no restrictions or you know rules for creating your your DMPs. As I said, the Horizon Europe uh, template is not mandatory. It's there for you. It's easier um, for you maybe. But if you have a, another tool that your institution, DMP Online, for instance, or Data Steward Wizard. Um, then yeah, please go ahead and, and use that, you know, make yourself, um, your life easier with this. Uh, does trusted mean certified repository for data? Uh, no. So um, certification is only one of the three uh, categories of trusted repositories. So one are the certified, another one are uh, domain specific that are internationally uh, recognized. Um, by the, the research community and uh, any other and the third categories any other repositories that have a set of um, specific um, uh, technical um, uh, aspects in them and that is where 
there is an issue uh, sometimes because not all institutional repositories mainly have those um, all those metadata fields and, and all this. But uh, certification is only one of those categories. Um, what is the process for the data sets that are marked as sensitive and according to the consortium DMP will only be available by application five years after the project is completed? Do we still need to create the Zenodo entry in that case, or is it enough to mark the dataset as available deliberate on the reporting system? Um, so it's even if you, so basically the, the, the rule is that data from a project should always exist somewhere online. People should know that that data set exists. So even if it's sensitive or if, there should still be some trace that researchers created it as part of the project. So in the case of sensitive uh, data, of course, you're not going to, to, to put it on the node, for instance, openly. But in some cases, there, there might be some um, at the national level, uh, for instance, it, it exists in some countries where they have a type of um, limited access uh, type of repositories that um, you, you apply for um, you apply for access uh, to, to it. Um, if those are compliant, then it would be visible. But if you don't have anything of that sort, you would still need to find a way to make it uh, visible. So again, it's not perfect, but one would be uploading the metadata on Zenodo. Um, if it's kind of sensitive data for other reasons, uh, like commercial uh, interest, like I said uh, before, for patents, or if there's any like security risk and this kind of things, then you can, uh, it doesn't necessarily always have to be when you created it, but you always need to justify that uh, because the rule is as soon as you create it, then it should be uh, visible that it exists online. Um, can you please provide a written document that states GTPAR complaints of Denado? Uh, I don't know. It should be on the Zenodo website. Um, but as uh, Victoria said, um, it is uh, DC checks for, for compliance. And the EU is the one who sets the GDPR. So if they are checking, then you know that it's GDPR compliance because it's an EU law. Um, if my project includes the creation of a large database to be progressively incremented over time, how am I supposed to proceed? Is there a way to update version of the same uh, database? Is it, uh, this data are to be shared through a dedicated user interface? Can, the, can this be linked on the Zenodo repository? Okay, so this question, I'm not going to go into details, uh, but this is the type of question that is very uh, specific to discipline and you need to consult with someone who, uh, like a data steward, or so someone who is, um, 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 that can really give you advice on uh, on 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 this. Um, wait, I lost the uh, the question. Yes. Um, so one way of doing it is to have, let's say, snapshots of uh, your data, where you're going to every I don't know month uh, give a, a snapshot of you know that that's month, even if it's incremental. Um, Zenodo and, and um, trusted repositories have uh, this rule of having versions. So you, you will see, for instance, on, on the slides of uh, this presentation, the, the slides, they are all the different versions of all the previous um, presentation I did for this, uh, um, for this webinar. So um, that's the, the same thing, and you would, uh, you would uh, do it like that. Um, but again, this is very specific, and I would recommend um, talking to a data steward, maybe in your institution, or um, someone that really can help you sit down with you and look at, uh, at that. 
Um, would you confirm that all these obligations are indeed applying also to other participants as affiliated entities and associated partners? Um, yeah, as soon as you partly funded by Horizon Europe, then yes, you have to comply. So even if it's, I don't know, 10% of your projects, you have to, to, to comply. Um, so I, I don't know, Victoria, if you... Agreed. Agree <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I just had a doubt uh, on on the wording of uh, other participants mm -hmm. or not. Okay. Um, could you please elaborate more on why are publishers' websites not considered repositories? Uh, the main reason is that they don't have a long-term preservation um, uh, policy. Uh, they don't have the uh, the infrastructure that is uh, this technical infrastructure that archives repositories uh, have. Um, it's really a set of different uh, requirements that um, it, it's it's a different software behind. It's a different tool. So um, websites are built in a completely different ways that uh, repositories are. So it's like comparing a, a house and a, and a storage, a house, or a shop and a storage. So the shop is the publisher. You're going to display your, your publications, but it's uh, if you store it in, in the back uh, of your store, if there's a fire, you know, it, it gets um, uh, destroyed. And, and we know of cases of uh, publishers and journals that disappear. And then the website is, you know, um, not available, 404, and then you don't have access to, to this uh, uh, knowledge. And archives repositories are really, you know, the storage unit where there's a lot of um, security in place. It's really well organized. It connects, it feeds, you know, the can feed to the uh, um, to the, the publisher's website and this kind of thing. So I don't know if the, the image uh, helps understanding, but it's not the same um infrastructure infra oh I can't <laughs> the same uh, technical things behind uh, the uh, the the tool some some um so one thing I forgot to mention is the only other um publisher that does uh, deposit immediately for you automatically for you on um trusted repository is uh, uh PubMed uh that Journals that have an agreement with PubMed, and those ones will um, automatically upload on uh, on PubMed to the Central. Can I add something here, uh, Jonathan? Yes, of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, additionally, as as uh, Jonathan explained uh, very well, the purpose, the mission, and the technical aspects of of the two are different. But also, we should say that repositories are mostly um, operated and supported by you know, institutions and communities uh, with the interest to preserve them in the future. And and frankly, we in the commission do think that um, in terms of the mission, it is part of the responsibility of the institution and the communities to preserve their output. It's not the publisher's job. The publisher's job is to publish the long-term preservation and access to those materials that my institution in Greece produces, et cetera, that's their job to uh, to safeguard and to provide access to and to make sure that they're there for the long term. That's not part of the publisher's job. Very true. Yeah. That's, yeah. I'll remember that you mentioned that in the few shades. I didn't think about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the new requirements for trusted repositories, where do we find them? As they're still in the MGA. Uh, the tax moment study you link to the repository can support the grantees in complying with all 18 mandatory and recommended requirements in relation to metadata. Um, yeah, so in the first, the second slide, I think I link all the uh, different to the MGA and the um, AGA. Um, Sorry, I'm just rereading. Can you pull the grantees in line with? Okay, uh, something about this uh, study. Now I'm I'm understanding a bit better. Um, 
it's a bit technical so i i must admit i uh, i discovered it last uh, last week and i didn't really have time to find a better way to format it for you to explore this i wanted to upload it on i don't know google sheets so that it's easier for you to have a list of all the different um uh, currently um, um, compliant uh, trusted repositories but the issue also with this study is that it's not going to be uh, updated so um, the things with the um, mandatory and uh, required uh, metadata fields is something very specific to see if uh, it complies with the metadata agreement and it's I will need to find it it's on page 47 51 maybe I, I was looking at it uh, yesterday so of the MGA if I'm not mistaken yeah it's under open science basically um, it's always under the open science uh, part under metadata requirements I don't know if that answers your question but right again if, if it didn't uh, how does pre-registration or registered reports work with um, Open Research Europe? Um, pre-registration, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll let you um, answer, Victoria, Victoria. I can answer that I don't know. Yeah. You, will need to, <laughs> you will need to go to the web page. I think there are uh, clear instructions, and I apologize for that, but yeah, I don't manage all the details. Uh, but um, I think they're very clear instructions. Uh, if you go in the web page per type of publication that you want to set up there, um, the point is that this venue actually requires uh, quite a bit of uh, transparency with uh, respect to depositing uh, data, making them open, etc. But I think they're very clear instructions. I mean, I guess what I can do is go on there now and find the place, but uh, you will find very easily the instructions for pre registrations. And currently, last question, we have an institutional repository in Figshare. I would like to know if it is trusted. So Figshare is uh, a repository, but you an institutional repository is different. So Figshare is a general purpose repository, um, which is currently not uh, considered as trusted. Um, and I'm guessing what you say about institutional repository meaning it's a it's a uh, not a group um, um, collection of um, publication for your institution specifically within Figshare I think from what I can understand but Figshare no isn't um, wouldn't be considered but as you mentioned yes you can look at uh, annex uh, one of the um, to, to check uh, check those. But again, um, this list will um, change over time. So you will need to kind of uh, find that information. And for that, uh, do get help from, you know, people in your institution, especially librarians that can help, help you with. Uh, the recordings will be shared, uh, so it will be uploaded on YouTube and will be shared after um, with the survey they sent after the um, the webinar. I don't know if there's any. Because I haven't looked at all at the chat. Uh... Okay. In that case, if you don't have any other questions, thank you a lot, Victoria, for being here, at least for the Q&A. It really helps every time to have uh, someone from the EC to uh, to answer those more tricks. Thank you, Jonathan. Questions. It's going to be late, so... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it happens. No worries. Um, I hope this was useful and... Um, and as I said, if you have, uh, well, no, maybe I didn't say it, but if you have any any doubts, you can always send us um, an email on helpdesk at openair.eu. Um, and um, yes, good luck with your projects and, you, uh, and um, with everything.
Thank you to the participants. Yes. Thank, thank you, you, Jonathan and Victoria, for your presentations. Thank you, everyone, for participating, and have a nice evening. Thank you.